Hello, so um, today I'll provide an update for this season on the new disease caused by neopistochopsis. I would like to start by acknowledging several people in our group who have worked hard collecting all the data I'll be showing today. In particular, our postdoc, Juliana Baju, our research assistant, Nani Wang, as well as several grad students, Mayara Bolognese, Marcos Marin, Paolo Mello, Carolina Ribello, and Adrian Zuniga. By now, I believe most growers are familiar with the symptoms of the disease, which start with uh, the small leaf spots uh, on the leaves. Those uh, spots can quickly um, expand to blight a significant portion of the leaves under uh, favorable weather conditions. The leaf spots can be easily confused with many other leaf spots out there, so if in doubt, just bring us a sample to the diagnostic clinic for proper identification. The fungus can also cause a fruit rot. In this case, the symptoms are very similar to those caused by anthracnose or colitotconacotaton. So again, if not sure, just bring us a sample to the clinic. I would like to spend a minute now going over the timeline on the emergence of this disease. We first had a significant problem in the 2018-19 season. We basically had five farms at that time with a significant problem. And the common link among those farms was the nursery source, which um, was the same nursery in North Carolina. Moving forward to the 1920 season, we had a significant uh, higher number of farms that had a problem. But again, it was easy to see, and particularly early in the season, a link with um, nursery source. In that case, there's two nurseries that had an issue, the same nursery in North Carolina, as well as a nursery in Canada that got plant stock from the North Carolina nursery. Moving forward to this season, we basically had the same number of farms that are infected, um, but the main difference is that we can't really see that link with a nursery source anymore. Um, what we see is that mostly fields that had the problem last season have it again, which unfortunately indicates that um, it seems the fungus has established in our fields. So what have we learned so far? Well, so one thing we know is that isolates from the recent outbreaks they are genetically distinct from isolates that we um, collect historically on strawberry, as well as isolates from strawberry production areas in other regions. I do realize this is a small to read, and I don't expect you to. Uh, what I basically want to show you, there's two clades. The blue one here includes isolates that were collected historically in strawberry fields in Florida and elsewhere. And now the um, isolates in the green box here are isolates that were collected from recent outbreaks. So based on these genetic differences, we have um, developed a quick molecular test that we've been using in our diagnostic clinic. So when we receive samples, we can tell whether it's the um, new um, and more aggressive species or the new Pistolochopsis rosy, which is not as aggressive. We have also confirmed that we, with um, pathogenicity tests that those isolates from the recent outbreaks, they're more aggressive than the other species that we had before. So basically in this graph here, we inoculated fruit and now uh, the isolates in the darker orange here, they cause significant more disease than those isolates in the lighter orange here. Um, this graph to the right is basically inoculation of leaves. Again, darker blue causes more disease than the um, lighter blue, which are basically isolates that were collected in the past. It's important to note here also that the symptoms are identical. The difference is that the new isolates cause more symptoms than isolates that we had collected historically. And this probably has to do with what we see in this slide, which basically shows that under the same conditions, the new uh, new Pistolochopsis species sporulates a lot more than new Pistolochopsis roses. So this is based on, on two different trials, and in both trials, the new species sporulate a lot more. So more spore basically means it can disseminate more to cause more disease. 
Um, as far as the conditions for um, growth and sporulation of the fungus, we have shown that the, the fungus likes warm, more towards warm temperatures. So basically this graph at the top shows the growth of the fungus in a petri dish at different temperatures. And the optimal temperature that we found was um, around 77, but the fungus does grow well all the way from 50 to 90. As far as the sporulation, how much um, spores it produces, it does seem to sporulate better at higher temperatures. In this case, um, 86 was the optimum for sporulation, but again, it does sporulate um, some all the way from 59 to um, 86. So um, putting it um, all together, the fungus likes warm temperatures and it's water spread. So basically those will be the conditions that are favorable for the disease development. And that's pretty much what we have early in the season when we have warm temperatures and then we turn uh, overhead irrigation for about 10 days to for plant establishment. So if the plants come with, with the pathogen and you have the favorable environment, we know we have a susceptible host, that's when the disease are going to start. You're going to see the first spots and the first symptoms right after plant establishment. And that's basically um, what we had also as far as conditions in mid to late December in, in 2019. Um, we basically had um, appeared in December 2019 for two weeks, starting around December 14 all the way to the end of December, where we had nine days where conditions were highly conducive for disease. Those will be those peaks here at the top. And, and that was just in a period of two weeks. And after that period, we basically seeing this in, in the fields, a lot of leaf spotting and, and blighting of the leaves. So um, looking at this um, season, and we're looking at a much um, larger period of time here, all the way from November until um, where we are now. So at the beginning of November, it um, didn't look good. We had um, the Ito tropical storm that brought a, um, quite a bit of rain. We had three days of um, high alerts, highly favorable conditions. And then just about 10 days later, we had another um, rain event, another couple of days when conditions were favorable. But after that, we got about a month of a break until just before Christmas, where we got a little bit of um, rain and a couple of days where conditions were favorable, but um, it was much cooler and, and it dried much quicker, so it was not as bad. And then we went on another month with cooler, nice weather conditions um, until about a couple of weeks ago where we had some, some rain, but again, not very significant because it was much cooler and it dried much quicker. So um, compared to last season, we basically had nine days in a period of two months where conditions were highly conducive compared to last season. We had nine days in two weeks. So basically the weather has been much nicer this season and that's one of the reasons why we don't see as much disease um, out there as, as we had it last year. Here is how the plants look like about 10 days after the tropical storm in our research plots. They all had symptoms, but the um, brilliance did look a bit more beat up than the sensation plants. And um, this is basically what we're seeing in our trials, then uh, brilliance and beauty do seem to be more susceptible than sensation. We have looked at several different cultivars and advanced selections in this trial, including the 1630-128 that we are releasing now as Florida Medallion, um, as well as the white cultivars or white selections. And those, um, interestingly, do not seem to be as susceptible as the red ones. The 1678-109 is the one that we're releasing. Moving on now into our fungicide trial. So before we actually started this trial, we screened a lot of materials in vitro and in a petri dish and identified the most effective to include in the field trial. And these are the results for the field trial up to now. 
Um, the red bar here is our non-treated control where we inoculated it and didn't treat it with anything. Uh, the products here in blue were considered not effective, meaning they're not uh, statistically different than the non-treated control. Um, all the treatments here in orange were um, statistically better than the non-treated control, even though I wouldn't say they're highly effective because as you can see, most of these um, only reduce disease to maybe about 50% of what you have in the non-treated control. So among those, we identify the ones that are uh, registered um, here are um, Tyram and Switch, which we had already talked about it last season. But we also um, have Rhyme, Inspire, and Tilt now showing up as options for rotations. Keep in mind that those three are from the same chemical group. They are FRAC3, so they need to be rotated with a different mode of action. Um, Omega and Bravo were um, the most effective, but they're not registered for um, fruit production fields, but could serve as good options for um, nurseries. Bravo is already registered for nurseries or chlorotalonil, and Omega is on the process of registration for nursery use only. If you want to learn more how we do those trials, check out our um, YouTube um, link in the GCRC website. Juliana and I have recorded a video showing how we do these trials. Uh, we also look at um, heat treatment as a way for nurseries that are getting plant stock from other nurseries that can maybe um, use a heat treatment to reduce um, infection that it might be coming with plant stock. So um, here we are um, looking at a protocol that we have developed, which um, it's basically 98.6 for an hour, followed by 111 for four hours. And what we see in those two graphs for leaf spot and, and fruit rot is that the heat treatment can significantly reduce the disease, but it does not completely eliminate. But it might be helpful when, uh, for nurseries that are getting plant stock from other nurseries that might be suspect. One question we were getting a lot last season was whether these fungals would be able to over summer in Florida. And well, it, it looks like it, it can and it looks like it did since many of the fields that were affected last season seem to have it again this season, which is unfortunate. So the question now is where? Is it surviving in, in alternative hosts, weeds, soil, crop residue? So we've been taking a, a lot of samples from, from um, all of this um, alternative hosts, weeds, and, and unfortunately it's a little bit more complex than we anticipated since Pestilochopsis, it's usually um, out there um, in, in many different crops, but a lot of the samples we're getting from other hosts, um, they're genetically not the same aggressive strawberry strain, and when we inoculate it on strawberry, they're just not as aggressive. Um, the ones that we're finding to be as aggressive, they're usually the ones that we're collecting from weeds in the strawberry field during the season, not between seasons. So um, there's still more, more to be done here, but one thing we're really looking close now is a crop residue. As I suspect, this may be one of the main culprits. I'm gonna finish up with some management recommendations. And uh, the first one, I think most of the growers uh, have already been doing that this season, which is to avoid harvesting and moving equipment through the fields when the plants are, are wet, because that's how one of the ways you can move um, the pathogen in the fields. I realize this is much easier to do early in the season when you don't have a lot of fruit than um, once we get in, in the peak, which is coming soon. Um, regarding fungicides, the recommendation is that we do um, rotations among the fungicides that were found to be effective and particularly during those times when conditions are favorable, those would be your best uh, choices. Um, it's not too early to start um, thinking and maybe planning strategies for crop and not long termination and perhaps removal. Um, I know this might be difficult or not feasible to do, but as I just mentioned on my previous slide, I do suspect that a lot of that inoculum is 
um, surviving in any crop residue that we are incorporating in our fields. And finally, I think we have a better chance to manage these if we start with clean transplant. So we do need to continue to work with our nurseries so the ones that don't have it can um, stay clean. With that, I would like to thank my team for all their hard work and for keep smiling during uh, many of those Zoom meetings during this pandemic and also FSREF for the funding to support this work.